Please remain standing. Take your Bibles this morning. 1 Peter chapter number 3. It's near the end of the New Testament, the end of your Bible. 1 Peter chapter number 3. Again, we're so grateful for all of our people that are with us, no matter where you are. We're thankful that you're with us. We have on Sunday mornings, our people would know, we've been going through this little book of 1 Peter. It was written by the Apostle Peter, just a short book, just five chapters long. We know that it was written about 60 A.D., and the theme of the book is Christian suffering. During this time that Peter wrote this, believers were under tremendous persecution. The Roman government was not favorable to the Christians at that time, and so Peter wrote this to encourage those Christians. Chapter 1, he reminded them about what it took to become a Christian. They had to be obedient to the gospel. They There were some agents that God used in their salvation. And there were some treasures that every Christian is given the moment that we got saved. Chapter number two, he talked about what should happen after we get saved. By the time we get to the middle of chapter two, he's talking about the Christian's relationships. One, to the government. Two, to the sins of this world. Three, to the workplace. Four, to God's will for our life. When we get to 1 Peter 3... He continues the Christian's relationship in the home and to other believers. A few weeks ago, we looked at uh, we looked at how to live a long and happy life. Peter wrote about that. A couple weeks ago, we looked at the Christian's attitude towards suffering, and we're kind of getting just a little piece of this pushback from this world about being a believer. How do you respond to that? And then, if you remember last time, we. We looked at, uh, it it was almost like Peter pushed the home button, and I said, if you have a GPS, of all the things that you could find with that, somewhere in there there's a home button, and wherever you're at, it'll take you home. And you know what? Home for a Christian is Calvary. And so we looked at 1 Peter 3, 18, where Peter, with all that he talked about, brought us back to the thoughts of Calvary. I'd like us to read this morning... 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, 19, 20, and 21. 1 Peter 3, verse 18 through 21. I'd like us to read together, reading it out loud. Let's begin there in verse number 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, in eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, again, we're thankful for every opportunity that we have to gather with Christians and to gather with you. And Lord, I pray this morning that we would rejoice once again. We have no idea what stands in our future. But Lord, we rejoice today that we can gather. You said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And so Lord, we have every reason to believe that you're here. Would you speak to us? Would our ears be open, our hearts be open? And Lord, we're wading into what uh, some would call a difficult passage of the Bible. And I pray to help us to make sense from it, from the Bible. Teach us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Again, last week we were in verse 18. And the reason I had us begin there is really verse 18 continues to verse 19 and to verse 20. It's all one sentence. And so again, last week we reminded ourselves from verse 18 about the message of Calvary. We looked at the pith of the message. And Calvary in the message we preach is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We looked at uh, last week the purpose of the message. The reason that we tell people this is to bring lost people to Christ. We looked at the preaching of the message. As much as it was the gospel that saved you and I, this world doesn't know the gospel. And so we need to take it to them And then we were reminded of the postlude, not everyone that hears the gospel will receive it. Some will, some won't. And you know what? It's a good thing. It's not our responsibility, their response. 
It's our responsibility to tell it. And so we looked at that last week and say, well, preacher, what are we looking at now? Well, on the heels of verse number 18 that was so clear and was so simple, if I could say it, and you so easily could wrap your hands around verse 18. As easy as verse 18 was, the three verses that follow verse 18 have become a trap that many false teachers and false isms are teaching to teach things that are nowhere found in the scriptures. You say, well, preacher, what is it you're talking about? Well, look there in verse 19. By which also he, Jesus, went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. You know that there's a church today called the Roman Catholic Church, and they have a doctrine, and that doctrine is purgatory. And that doctrine is that when you and I die, we don't instantly go to heaven or to go to hell, but rather when we die, we go to a middle place. And they call that middle place purgatory. And they say in that middle place, people are kept there until the fires of purgatory cleanse their sin. And that's why it's called purgatory or purgatory. You say, Pastor, do we believe in purgatory? No, and we don't believe in purgatory because the Bible doesn't teach it. But they teach that after Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, that Jesus went to this middle place and he preached to those people in this middle place and some of those people embraced what Jesus preached. And basically, they're saying in verse number 19, that's purgatory. You say, Pastor, I've never heard that. Then you've not talked to none enough Catholics yet. Look at verse 19 again. By which also he, that's Christ, went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So someone's being imprisoned here, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So some take from verse 19 and the first half of verse 20 this doctrine of purgatory. Well, there's a second doctrine that they, others have found in here. Look there and now in the middle of verse number 20. Middle of verse 20 says, While the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Now look at the beginning words of verse 21. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. I'm saying in these three verses, 19, 20, and 21, there are two false doctrines that are being taught today. Now, folks, sometimes, and sometimes in preaching it's light and it's easy and it's rejoicing and you can be half asleep and still get your handle on it. That was last week. That was verse 18. We're wading into verse 19, 20, and 21. You can't sleep. You have to pay attention because this is what's called deep doctrine. And if you aren't careful in these verses, you'll buy into either purgatory or you'll buy into the second false doctrine. And the second false doctrine is baptismal regeneration. Preacher, I've never heard of that term before. Baptismal regeneration is the idea that your faith in Christ alone will not get you to heaven. It's the teaching that you have to, yes, place your faith in Christ, but you also have to be baptized in water. And though your faith in Christ is necessary, it's also necessary to be water baptized, for they teach if you're not water baptized, you're not saved. He said, Pastor, how would anyone find that in the Scriptures? Look again at the middle of verse 20. The Bible talks about Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Then look at verse number 21. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. It's not hard to see how they have taken those words to teach that doctrine, and we know that even in our town here, as we have knocked on doors, handed out tracts, witnessed to people, we know that inevitably you run into some that believe in purgatory. 
you know that we run into some that believe if you're not baptized, you can't get to heaven. And I'm saying to you that many of them would like to use these verses to support that as clear as chapter 3, verse 18 is. This verse 19, 20, and 21, it's not quite as clear. And so this morning we get to tackle it. Say, Pastor, really? We systematically go through the book of Peter. And this is the next text. If you're writing titles, I know many of our do. Uh, my title this morning is Cleansed by Fire and Saved by Water. Cleansed by Fire and Saved by Water. Now, if you've attended this church for any period of time, you know that we don't believe in purgatory. And you know that we don't believe in baptismal regeneration. Absolutely not. Of course we don't. I'm trying to arm you with some Bible that one day when someone challenges you on either of those, you're going to be able to answer both of those. Look again there at verse number 19. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Could I give you, first of all, again, if you're taking notes, I want us to consider, can we really be cleansed by fire? Again, point number one, can we really be cleansed by fire. Again, verse number 18, and we saw last week how clearly it talked about the Lord Jesus Christ. The person of verse number 18 that is highlighted is Christ. And we know the place, the event that took place that verse 18 talked about is Calvary. And we know the power by which Jesus Christ accomplished what he did at Calvary was the Spirit of God. Look at verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so verse number 18, we've all, we already dealt with that. But then on the heels of that, look again at verse 19. By which, well, what's that? That's talking about by the Spirit there in the end of verse 18. So by the Spirit, he... He is Jesus Christ. So again, right around this time of Calvary, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Pastor, what's verse 19 talking about? Well, let's first of all begin with something that we're all familiar with. You know that when a person dies now, if you die today, hope it's not today, but if you or I died today, instantly, our soul would either go to a place called heaven or our soul would go to a place called hell. That's not decided by living a good life. It's not decided by attending a church. It's not decided by morality, baptism, or anything like that. The Bible says that that is decided by trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. And so if you're saved, you go to heaven. If you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, you can't go to heaven, you go to a place called hell. We're familiar with how it happens now. In other words, if I drop dead right now, you would deal with my body, but that real part inside of me, my soul, would either instantly be in a place called heaven or be in a place called hell. There is no middle place. Keep your hand there in First Peter, if you would, Second Corinthians chapter 5. Now we're going to give you a lot of scriptures here this morning. It wouldn't hurt to write some down. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And you know, the Paul, uh, Apostle Paul told us that uh, very clearly that if you're saved, the moment that you pass on, your soul goes to heaven. Look there in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 8. Paul wrote, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So for a Christian, the moment that you die, you are instantly in the presence of God. Look there in verse number one, while you're at that, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse one. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, let's talk about your body. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God a house not made with hands, eternal in heavens. Again, the moment that you die, your body begins to deteriorate. But at that very moment, you already have a home in heaven. 
Folks, that's a great promise for a Christian. On the other hand, if someone has never trusted Christ as their Savior, the Bible says that the moment that they die, although people will take care of their body, their soul goes to a place called hell. Psalm 9, 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Jesus said, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You notice in all those verses, it's heaven or it's hell. There is no middle place. And uh, yet, uh, preacher again, what, what determines our destination? It's what you've done with Jesus Christ. Very familiar verse, John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, that's the conditional determinator if you've trusted Christ. We know the Bible says in 1 John 5, 12, he that hath the son hath life and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 13, these things have written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So, preacher, what determines heaven or what determines hell? It's what you've done with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, th that's common. Th th that we're familiar with that. Having said that, Pastor, what is this talking about? Jesus went and preached to some spirits in prison. Well, look over there in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, you can get rid of 2 Corinthians 5. If you would still keep 1 Peter chapter 3. But in Luke chapter 16, we are told, the Lord told us about two that died. And they went to those two different places, almost. Luke chapter 16, do you know that a believer, oh, sorry, let's start the other way, an unbeliever before Calvary, when they died, they instantly went to that place called hell. Luke chapter 16 and Verse number 22, look at the middle of the verse, the rich man. Luke 16, verse 22. The Bible says the rich man also died and was buried. That's his body. Look at verse 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. So again, before Calvary, if an unbeliever died, they went to that place called hell. But what about a believer? Well, look there in Luke 16 and verse number 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abram's bosom. Now, again, if you've been around here for a while, you understand these things, but we always anticipate somebody new. Do you know before Calvary, when a believer died, they did not go to heaven? He said, Preacher, why? Because the full price for their sin had not been paid. In the Old Testament, we know that the Jews made animal sacrifices. But Hebrews chapter 10 says the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. And so again, those in the Old Testament believers, in the Old Testament when they died, they went to a place called Abram's bosom. They preacher why? Because they were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for the Redeemer. They were waiting for someone to come along and pay the price. And if you know the story here in Luke chapter 16, we know that two men died. One went instantly to hell. The other went instantly to Abram's bosom. We are told that, and look at verse number 24. And he, that's the man in hell, cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. And so uh, I want you to notice that the man in hell, it, it wasn't a party, it wasn't a while, well, I'll be with my friends, I'll have a happy time. No, he was in torments. But look again at the end of verse number 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abram afar off. You know the man in hell could see the man in Abram's bosom. He could see him. He couldn't get to him, but he could see him. I'm telling you that before Calvary, everyone that died went into the lower parts of the earth. There was two compartments. One was hell, 
The other one's Abram's bosom. Look there in verse 25. But Abram said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. I'm saying to you, before Calvary, down deep in the heart of this earth, there was that place called hell. It's still there. Lost people still go to that place called hell. But there was another place down in the center of the earth. It was called Abram's bosom. It was also called paradise. Do you remember when Jesus hung on the cross and said to that repentant thief, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise? I'm saying that they went to both places. You say again, preacher, why is it that they went to Abram's bosom? Because they were still waiting for the Messiah. They were still waiting for someone to pay the complete price of redemption. They were being held down there until Calvary's price was paid. And although those Old Testament saints had done all that God required them to believe, they weren't able to pay for the redemption of their sins. And they waited for someone else to do that. And when Jesus was nailed to the cross of Calvary and paid the full price for our sins, our Lord descended down into the lower parts of the earth. And our Lord went to that one side, that hell side, not to give them a second chance, not to say, listen, I paid the price. Would you trust me now? He went to that hell side and he said, you didn't think the payment would be made. You blew it. You didn't do what was right. You're condemned for all of eternity. And he said, Pastor, are there any verses that would back up that teaching? After he went to that side, he went to the other side and he said, good news. I've paid the price for sin. I think that Jesus, when he got to the other side, I think he held up those nail-scarred hands. And if there was any hooping and hollering going on in Abram's bosom, it started then because that's exactly what they were waiting for. Pastor, again, are there any verses that would substantiate that whole thinking? Look there in Hebrews. You don't need Luke anymore. Look there in Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Now, as a preacher, I've never heard of this before. It's in the Bible. There are scriptures that speak of it. Hebrews chapter number 9. Look there, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 9 and begin in verse number 11. Hebrews 9 and verse 11. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and of the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctifying the purifying of the flesh, now watch verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Stop for a moment there. That's that word purge. Remember purgatory? Folks, there's no way that fire will ever purge anyone's sins. The only thing that can purge our sins is the blood of Christ. Verse number 15, Hebrews 9 and verse 15. And for this cause, he, Christ, is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, that's Jesus' death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now, now you know what? You and I, after Calvary, we look back at Calvary and say, that's when my sins were paid for. And if we each have a testimony of trusting Christ, the day I trusted Christ, 
Jesus' blood from Calvary was applied to my sins. I'm saved. I'm redeemed. I'm cleansed by his blood. But you know those Old Testament saints, as they were being held in that place, Abram's bosom, also called paradise, they waited. They waited for a redeemer. They waited for redemption. And I don't know if you caught it, because we read verse 15 pretty quickly. But Jesus' price paid, not only for we that live after Calvary, but his, his blood paid for the price of those that were under the First Testament. That's the Old Testament. And it redeemed them in the Old Testament. Again, I'm saying to you that Jesus took that good news. Look there in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, I believe as Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth, I think on his person were two keys. The Bible describes that in Revelation 1 and verse number 18. Jesus makes the statement, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Now, that's interesting. He has two keys. And so as he descended there in the lower parts of the earth, he took off the first key, the key of hell, and he opened up that door. And all those that were screaming in torments in there, he announced to them, you blew it. I paid the price but it doesn't help you whatsoever. And folks, that's what 1 Peter 3 and verse 19 is talking about. He preached to the spirits in prison that once had been disobedient in the days of Noah. Well, their disobedience landed them in that place. He stepped out of that, that place, used his key to lock that door. He was the only one that was able to go across that great gulf. And with the second key, the key of death, he opened up that second place. And again, he said, good news. I've paid the price for your redemption. You are now redeemed. Let's go. What a great truth. And it's a great truth that uh, we find there in 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 19. I'm saying to you, he had no good news to preach to those in hell. And yet he had every bit of good news to preach to those in Abram's bosom. Again, if you would, uh, on your way there, look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 19, by which also he, Jesus, went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient. When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, he preached to disobedient people, you blew it. Then he went to the other side and he preached to them a completely different message. So, Pastor, where does the Bible talk about that? Look at 1 Peter 4 and verse 6. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 6. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to the men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit, Say again, preacher, I've never heard of this before. Acts chapter number 2. Let me give you just a couple more verses. Acts chapter number 2. We know that uh, when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, Peter, made, uh, Peter preached a message, and of course 3,000 believed after he preached what he preached. But right within that message, look there in Acts chapter number 2, and begin there in verse 22. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now, let's think of it for a minute. This is the day of Pentecost. Pentecost, Penta, five. Pentecost is 50 days after the Passover. It was on the Passover that those Jews cried out, crucify him. According to Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 16, every Jewish man was required three times a year to go to Jerusalem to worship. They went on the day of the Passover. They went on the day of Pentecost. 
they went on the day of the Feast of Tabernacles. These people that were standing here in Jerusalem that Peter preached to, these people were in Jerusalem 50 days before. They were the ones that cried out, crucify. Now, 50 days later, Peter's putting it on them. <laughs> Look there again in verse number 20, uh, 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Now, he's, he's not tiptoeing around the truth. You were the ones that were guilty of crucifying Christ. No wonder at the end of his message, people said, what do we do to fix it? No wonder they did. But back to Peter's preaching. Keep going there. Look at verse 25. He's just talked about this resurrection of Christ in verse 24. Verse 25, for David speaketh concerning him. So David wrote something, said something about Christ. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For as he is on my right hand that I should not be moved, therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. It looks like Peter is saying, you remember when David said that God wouldn't leave David's soul in hell? Well, Peter's about to correct that misunderstanding. He's saying when David said that, it was a prophecy of Christ at Calvary. Keep reading there in verse 27. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you, Peter speaking, of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So Peter is saying, David wasn't talking about himself. Because he said, David is still buried. We know where his tomb is. Well, who is he talking about? Verse number 30. Therefore, being a prophet, David, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on the throne. He's saying, David wasn't talking about himself. David wasn't saying, God didn't leave my soul in hell. Well, then who is he talking about? He was talking about Christ. Keep reading. Verse 31, he seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. Pastor, are there any other scriptures that tell us when Jesus died on the cross and they laid his body in the tomb, that his soul went down to hell. Peter's message on the day of Pentecost. Now, let me clarify something. Jesus in hell wasn't suffering. He paid the full price for our sin when he hung on the cross of Calvary. That's why he said it is finished. But our Lord Jesus did go down to that one side. And he said, you blew it. And he went to that other side and said, good news, it's paid. And he took them out. Ephesians chapter number 4. You can let go of Acts, Ephesians chapter 4. And I say, well, this is all pretty heavy stuff. Well, it's all what we hit in 1 Peter 3. Ephesians chapter number 4. Pastor, are there any other references about Christ making that trip down into hell and coming back up again? Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 8. Uh, start in verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he, Christ, ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. So when our Lord ascended, he took someone with him. It says he took somebody that had been in captivity. He took them with him. Keep reading. Now, verse 9, now that he ascended what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, 
that he might fill all things. I'm trying to say to you this morning that the teaching of purgatory is not true. When you die, when you breathe your last breath, you either go to a place called heaven because you've trusted Christ or you go to a place called hell because you did not trust Christ. There's no middle place. There's no middle ground. And if someone chooses to use 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 19 to suggest that Peter was giving somebody a second chance, there are no second chances. Our, cha our opportunity to trust Christ is here and now. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, uh, now is the day of salvation. Folks, it's not fire that saves anybody. It's not fire that cleanses any one of their sins. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Pastor, I, I was sure somewhere fire was involved in a judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, when you and I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, look there in verse number 13. And Christians stand at the judgment seat of Christ, 1 Corinthians 3.13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. You know, if you're saved this morning, the moment that you die, you are instantly in heaven. And the Bible says that all of we who are in heaven one day will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. We're there because we're saved. But everything that we have done for Christ since we got saved, that will be judged by fire. And that fire for some people, all their works will be wood, hay, and stubble. It's gone. Others who have served the Lord genuinely, sincerely, that'll be rewarded. Again, let's go back there to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, I... <laughs> recognize we're wading into deep waters. We're looking this morning at cleansed by fire and saved by water. Pastor, can we really be cleansed by fire? No. Only the blood of Christ. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Back there, look in 1 Peter chapter 3. Now look at the middle of verse number 20. Get there with a name Noah, middle of verse 20. Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Pastor, I find that pretty confusing. You know, the second teaching that is circulating around has been around for a long time is this idea that you need to be water baptized to be saved. And they'll use the end there of verse number 20. Eight souls were saved by water. That's talking about Noah's day. Noah, his wife, his three sons, they each had a wife that was eight. And we know that Noah was told to build that ark, and we know what, that Noah was told, the Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness and so as they built they preached they built they preached they built they preached and one day when that ark was done God brought those animals to that ark and they they preached in hopes that more people would get in we know that uh, there's no record of anyone else getting in that ark with them and the Bible says the rains began to fall 40 days and 40 nights that's what this verse is talking about. But I want you to think. I want you to use some common sense. Did the water really save those eight? Of course not. It was being in the ark that kept them safe from the water. I've been in discussions a number of times in soul winning with, uh, with Church of Christ people that think you have to be water baptized to get to heaven. And they've taken me to this verse, and they said, the verse very plainly says, eight souls were saved by water. So I said, you think the water saved them? I said, they didn't even touch the water. 
I said, in fact, the rest of the world was the ones that touched the water. So if you're saved by water, the rest of the world was saved, and those eight weren't saved. Well, you know, they've got a bit of a problem with that. That doesn't make any sense. And if you've ever dealt with these people, they have circular reasoning. As soon as you start nailing their toes down here, they go to the next one, and they go to the next one. And so look at the next one they go to. Look there in verse number 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. You say, oh, Pastor, I've, I'm not much for arguing with people, but doesn't that sound pretty convincing? <laughs> Bible makes it very pretty clear, Pastor, the like figure wherein to baptism doth also now save as well a couple of things. First of all, it says it's a figure. It's a picture. But I want you to notice the second thing. There's not a period after the word save us. Do you know what I've learned in all these years? You always want to watch what a cult won't read. You always want to watch where they stop. Look there again in verse number 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Oh, well, hold on a minute. <laughs> no wonder they won't read any further. That just said that baptism does nothing to put away the filth of our flesh. Baptism does nothing to save us from our sins. And so the reason that they stop after reading those opening words is because if they read the rest of it, it would totally turn upside down their thinking. Secondly, if you're taking notes, can we really be saved by water? You know, again, there's not a period after the verse 21 where it says save us. Let me remind you about baptism. Do you know in the Old Testament, there was no one that was water baptized? David wasn't water baptized. Adam wasn't water baptized. Abram wasn't water baptized. You won't find water baptism anywhere in the Old Testament. Now, there are a couple of types of water baptism. Water baptism, of course, if you do it right, you're going to do it by immersion. And in water baptism, you are placed underneath that water and brought back up and so in a baptism you've got water above you got water here water here and often water here there are two perfect types in the old testament of water baptism do you remember when moses led the nation of israel we know that they were set free from egypt a picture of our redemption that redemption was accomplished by the blood being applied to that door that's a picture of salvation just a picture. You can't put blood on the door of your house and be saved. It's a picture. Well, once they were set free from Egypt, we know that they came to the Red Sea. And God miraculously parted that Red Sea. And that nation went through that Red Sea. And we know that there was water here, and there was water here, and there was that cloud of God that was there. That's a picture of salvation but again it's a picture of people who had already had a picture of their redemption you know the other picture of baptism is this one Noah that's why it's mentioned in first Peter 3 we know that when Noah was in that ark there was water here and water here and water here and as it was raining there was water here I'm saying to you it's a picture but hold on that's not what saved them. They were saved already when they got into that ark. Well, some people say that Naaman getting baptized. Remember Naaman, he had leprosy. He was a Syrian. He worshipped another god. One day someone said, Naaman, with your leprosy, if you could just get to the prophet, he'd heal you, 2 Kings 5. Well, the prophet said, if you'll go to the Jordan River and dip seven times... And so some say that that's a picture of baptism. It's really a lousy picture. You say, Pastor, why is it a lousy picture? First of all, he wasn't a believer. Secondly, he grumbled at getting dipped seven, time, seven times. It's not a very good picture. And he baptized himself. That's not a very good picture. And he wasn't a believer before he did it. And 
if he was a believer after he did it, it wasn't a very good one. I'm saying in the Old Testament, there are only types of baptism. New Testament opens up, John the Baptist comes on a scene, and he preaches repent. And folks, ultimately, that's what we preach. He preaches repent, and he said, to you that have repented, I need to baptize you. That baptism didn't save them. It was their repentance that saved them. You know, throughout the scriptures in the New Testament, baptism is always something that's done after somebody gets saved. Up there again, if you would, in First Peter, uh, before you do, Acts chapter number 8. Acts chapter number 8, probably the very best passage to turn someone to to help them to understand about water baptism is Acts chapter number 8. We know here in Acts chapter 8, the Bible tells us verse number 5 about a man named Philip. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. So Philip preached the gospel. There were many people that when they heard the gospel, they got saved. Look there in verse number 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. So after they were believers, they got baptized. Well, you know the story. We know that Philip was seeing a great revival taking place in Samaria. And to Philip's disappointment, I would think, look at verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And I don't know, I would. <laughs> Lord, this is a great revival going on here. You want me to leave this and go to a desert? Really? And you know, sometimes the ways of God are not the ways of man. And so he did. And he went out there on that desert road, and I suppose he saw people walking, and I suppose he saw chariots, and, 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 and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, he's got his suitcase in one end and a laptop in the other end. Lord, now what? Well, look, look what happened next while he's trying to get some direction from God. Look there in verse number 29, uh, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. So the Spirit of God told him, I want you to go talk to that man. Lo and behold, he gets to that man, and that man is reading the Scriptures, not saved, reading the book of Isaiah. And look there in verse number 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same Scripture and preached unto him Jesus. <laughs> Philip said, let me tell you about what's happening. And he gave him the gospel. He told him that Christ had died for his sins. He told him that all the price had been paid and all that you need to do is receive it. And you know, we believe that that Ethiopian eunuch bowed his head and trusted Christ. And I think Philip, as any good soul winner would, Philip said, now let me tell you about the next step and let me tell you what should follow next. And he wasn't about to leave that chariot. He had a new convert and he began to tell them all these things, and watch what happens there in Acts chapter number 8 and verse number 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. So they, they, these two are in this chariot. And they come across some water, be it a river, a stream, a pond, a lake. Verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? Now that's the question, isn't it? You know, Philip's answer is not found in the New Bible versions. If you have an NIV, Acts 8.37 isn't there. If you have a New American Standard, it's not there. Do you know Acts 8.37 is the strongest verse in the entire Bible that you have to be saved before water baptism means anything in your life? He said, what doth hinder me from being baptized? Look at verse 37. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. You know what Philip said? You've got to be saved first. You've got to be a believer first. Watch this new convert's answer in the end of verse 37. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You know what? What a testimony. He said, I am a believer. Verse number 38, and he commanded the chariot to stand still. 
And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, I'm saying to you that's the clearest text in all of Scripture. Back to 1 Peter 3, I'm almost done. 1 Peter chapter 3, we have looked at two questions. Can you be cleansed by fire? Is there a place called purgatory? No. The only way to be cleansed is by the precious blood of Christ. Pastor, can we be saved by water? No. Water baptism is the first step after you're saved. Look there again, 1 Peter 3, verse 21. The like figure... Whereon to even baptism doth also now save us. Now notice it, very next thing is a bracket. A bracket in English language is always extra material. So for just a moment, we never correct the King James Bible, but for just a moment, let's take out this extra material and let's get the beginning and the end to get the statement. Verse 21, the like figure, wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Look at the end of the bracket by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know the first truth about baptism? It's a picture. It's a picture of the resurrection of Christ. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus was buried. And Jesus rose again. And that's why when we baptize people, they're standing in that tank. We ask them, if you trust in Christ as your Savior, if they say yes, we say upon your profession of faith, we now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of Christ's death, and raised... Do you know what? Baptism is a picture. Now, you know it's true that there have been many churches that have come up with alternative ways to baptize. Immersion is the Bible way to baptize. And I know that we have folks that come from other churches, and, Pastor, I was sprinkled... They did not take Christ's body and lean his body against a tree and sprinkle dirt on it. That's not how Jesus was buried. They took his body and laid it in a tomb. I know that some come here and when baptism, they were convinced that pouring was okay. Could I say to you, they didn't take dirt and pour it on Christ when he was buried. He was laid in a tomb and three days later he rose again pastor does it matter it has to be the right picture i haven't seen the arbos i it's it's been a long time this brother has been faithful to call and he'll call once in a while and email and all the rest of that but 25 years maybe 30 years that means it's been that long since they, you know, they've never seen my wife. And so if they came to me and said, we've never seen your wife. You got a picture of her? Now, I'd never do it because my wife would kill me. But if I open up my wallet and pulled out another woman's picture and said, well, this is close enough. <laughs> close enough. Uh, it'd be a good thing he's preaching tonight because I wouldn't make it till tonight. Do you understand a picture close enough is no good? Well, you know, this woman, she has blonde hair, and my wife has blonde hair. And this woman, she's five foot three, and my wife's five foot three. And I mean, goodness, this woman has hazel eyes, and my wife has hazel eyes. And this woman's wearing glasses, and my wife wears glasses. And so it's close enough. You'd say, Pastor, how dare you represent your wife with the wrong picture. First thing I say to you about baptism, it has to be the right picture. It has to picture that resurrection. And so maybe someone's here today, maybe someone's listening to me today, and someone tricked you into being baptized in a way that did not picture the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And many have. Many have been duped into that. Why don't you fix it? Why don't you get it taken care of? Why don't you get it done right? First thing we see in 1 Peter 3, 21, it has to be the right picture. Second thing we see again in verse 21, the beginning of the brackets, not the putting away the filth of flesh. Baptism does nothing to save your soul. Baptism does nothing to cleanse you of sin. 
I give you the third thing that we learn in verse 21. It's also in that bracket. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. You know, I say, oh, preacher, if, if baptism doesn't get us to heaven, why would we get water baptized? Because it's a statement that in your heart, you want to do what God wants you to do. That's a good conscience. You ever had, uh, if you can remember that, back that far, ever had your parents ask you to do something before you go to bed tonight, want to make sure you take care of this, mow the lawn, trim the hedge, weed the garden, take the garbage out, and you didn't do it. You wouldn't do it. I'm not doing that. Well, you know what happens when they come home at the end of the day? You kind of try to avoid them because you didn't obey what they said. And you avoid them because you have a bad conscience. You know what baptism is? The Lord said, you don't have to do this to get to heaven. But after you get saved, I'm asking you to do this. And when you do it, it's the answer of a good conscience. You say, well, preacher, if you don't want to get baptized to get to heaven, why would I do it? To tell the Lord, or whatever you want next, I'm ready. You know, over the years, we've had some interest. I won't give you names for some of these. I remember when we were still in the Elks Hall in those first few years, I preached on baptism. And I explained from the Bible about baptism. And one of our men came to me after the service on his way down those Elks stairs, if you uh, were with us way back then. And he stopped me and he said, Pastor, he said, I, I know that everything that you're saying about baptism is right. And preacher, I know that I should get water baptized. He said, Preacher, I'm saved. I know that's the next step. I'm just going to wait till we're in our own building before I get baptized. And I said, Brother, we might be in this rental building for 10 years, and we were. And so I said, I want you to do what God has asked you to do. I can't make you. But I said this to him. I said, and, it, and this makes sense. If you, we've had, We have little babies around here, and first of all, they just... They just lay there. After a while, they learn to kind of roll around. Then they get on their knees and they start crawling. And then they get the nerve up to stand, and they're holding on to something. And then you know how often they try to take that first step. <laughs> take that first step. Take that. <laughs> We've all watched them. And you know, moms, they're so worried. Dads just say, try it again. Don't cry. You know, so, but it's that first step that's just a killer. Do you know when that child makes that first step successfully, there's no stopping that child. It's gone. And do you know what I've seen in the Christian life? You can take the gospel and see someone get saved. But you see them take that next step. If they won't take that step of baptism, boy, that Christian life just seems to, they just came to flounder in it. They just struggle with some of the craziest things. They just get hung up about, well, look what she's doing. When You don't have to worry about someone else. You need to take the next step. And I've found Christians that take the next step, and they're going on for God. Remember that next Sunday? Remember that man that said, I'm going to wait till we have our own church building? Right in the invitation, I, of course, as always, if you're not saved, you need to trust Christ as your Savior. And you know how hardly ever do it. But I said, and if you've been saved but not baptized, would you just do what God's asked you to do? And you know, while the invitation was going on and heads were bowed and eyes were closed, I watched this man. He was in the second row. And he, he looked around at other people while the piano was playing and everybody's eyes were closed. And he finally, if you remember in the Elks Hall, the chairs weren't connected. He finally took his hands and he just pushed those chairs aside and came running through, and he said, I'm ready. And I said, you ready for what? I'm ready to do what God wants me to do. And you know, he got baptized just a couple weeks later. That man went on for God. Preacher, can we be cleansed by fire? No. The only way you can be saved is by trusting the blood of Jesus Christ for your sins. Preacher, can we be saved by water? No. You can only be saved by trusting Christ as your Savior. But after you're saved, that's the next step. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed as a pianist comes to play a song, 
Father, we've looked at these three verses. We, we rejoice in verse 18. Great reminder of Calvary. We saw that last time. Lord, we've waded into pretty difficult verses this morning. There are some that teach purgatory. Lord, there's no such place. When we die, we either go to heaven because we trusted Christ or we go to hell because we have not There's no middle place. Lord, if there is one listening to my voice today that has never trusted you as their Savior, Lord, they need to do that. Oh, we'd love to take a Bible and show them that. But then, Lord, baptism, water baptism. The Bible makes it clear how it's to be done. It's to be done by immersion makes it clear when it's to be done. It's to be done after a person gets saved. Lord, if there's someone listening to my voice today that they've been saved, but they haven't been baptized since they've been saved, Lord, that's the next step. And Lord, it might be that many here are saved and baptized. I wonder, Lord, do we still have a good conscience toward God where he has asked us to do what's next and next and next? Can we still look God in the eye and say, yes, sir, I'll do it, I'll do it. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, no one looking around. I wonder how many this morning could say, Pastor, if I were to die today, I'm absolutely sure that I'd go to heaven. Not maybe, not a hope so. But preacher, I've trusted Christ as my Savior. If that's your testimony, would you slip your hand up for a moment? Preacher, I know that I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. You can take your hands down with heads still bowed and eyes closed. There's someone, preacher, I couldn't raise my hand there. I'm not sure if I died and go to heaven. I need to be saved. Here's my uplifted hand. Please pray for me. Is there one like that this morning? And then with your head still bowed and eyes closed, is it possible that there's one here? You see, preacher, I've been saved, but I've not been baptized since I got saved. Not been put under deep water and immersion. I've not done that yet. That's the first step after salvation. I need to do it. Here's my uplifted hand. Please pray for me. Is there one like that? God bless you. There's someone else. Father, in a moment as the piano is played, would you help us? There's someone who needs to be saved. They need to get saved, and we'd like to show them from a Bible how to do it. If there's someone saved, not yet baptized in deep waters, Lord, we'd like to take care of that. But Father, for many, many who are saved and baptized, are we still obedient to you? Do we still have a good conscience toward God? Or are we trying to avoid the Lord? We pray to help us. Bless the invitation. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed as the piano begins to play, God speak to your heart this morning. And that thing about a good conscience? God dealing with your heart about something? Why don't you talk to the Lord? You've not been saved. We'd love to take a Bible and show you how to be saved. If you've been saved but not been baptized, the Bible way, we'd love to take a Bible and show you that. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for the word of God. And Lord, you deal with the easy things and the difficult things. We thank you for the scriptures. Help us to be 
Help us to be students of your word, to understand what these things say. Lord, I pray for someone not saved, that they trust Christ as their Savior. How we'd love to show them from a Bible how to do it. Lord, we pray for someone saved but not baptized yet. Let us show them. Lord, we pray for each of us, saved and baptized. Lord, that we would be continually obedient to you. We ask that you dismiss us now and take us to our own safely. Lord, bring us back for a prayer time at 5.30, service at 6. We'll ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed.